Let's just put together. I, I do want to um, talk about a new uh, award that we have. Our friend and colleague, Wayne Carlin, who is a veteran, just won the Juniper Prize for a book that's coming out next year. A teacher, he's been with CSM for 30 years. He created this reading series, actually, with Roger Horn. And he's inspired students in the community with his stories of loss and redemption, cycles of violence and how they can be broken. He's dedicated his life to reminding us of our shared humanity and how precious it is and how easily we can lose it. And more than, I don't know, 10 or 15 years ago, I introduced Wayne with this story. One time he was giving a, a reading here at the college. An old man is planting a fruit tree. A passerby wonders why he would bother to plant a tree that won't bear fruit until decades after he's dead. And the old man says, as my father planted before me, so do I plant for my children. The story models tikkun olam, which is a Hebrew phrase that means repair the world. And the belief is that we have an obligation to leave this world better than we found it. And this is what Wayne has done. Through his teaching and his writing, he's made this little corner of the world better. And so it's my privilege and honor to tell you that now we have a new Wayne Carlin Creative Writing Award that will be given each year to one CSM student at Honors Convocation as a small but heartfelt gesture of gratitude for all Wayne has done for our community. Thanks, man. And well, there's Edna. <laughs> so I do, I, 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 Edna hired me years ago. Yes. She was foolish enough to hire me <laughs> a long time ago. As chair of our department, she has, she was a calm, steady presence. That much I knew. And when I found out she was from Indiana, I figured it was her middle America upbringing that allowed her to take every crisis in stride, level-headed through all the interdepartmental politics and student complaints. And, but I think it was that she faked it really well. I, I'm, pretty, <laughs> I, I'm pretty sure that's, that, that's what I saw. But what she did is she kept our department cohesive, collegial, warm, friendly, a team, a family, all working together toward the same goal, to teach our students as best we can, to inspire them, to love learning, and to stay curious. And it, it wasn't always successful. I mean, we, we, plenty of students fell through the cracks but her contribution to CSM cannot be over, overstated. We are indeed privileged and honored to have her as part of the CSM family. What's more, while she did all this, she was writing the whole time. She co-authored two college rhetoric texts, an anthology of Christmas, Christmas literature, articles, book reviews, essays. She never stopped. And tonight, she's going to talk to you about her most recent book, which shows her interest in local history, like history, but local history, telling one man's story, Henson's journey from La Plata to, to Canada. And through this one man's story, she speaks to our nation's dark history of slavery and the impulse toward freedom that resides in each of our hearts. In times like these with nationalism and anti-Semitism and white supremacy and xenophobia, we need this message of hope now more than ever. To repair the world, to leave it just a little bit better than how we found it. So join me in welcoming Edna Twain. Good evening and thank you so much for coming. Um, one of the greatest heroes of the Underground Railroad a man who repeatedly risked his life to come back from Canada and lead people to safety. Um, 
was, was born almost exactly three miles from where you are sitting right now. And yet, until a couple years ago, almost nobody knew his name. Uh, in the second half of the 19th century, Josiah Henson was pretty much a household name in, uh, can you hear me back there? Okay. Pretty much a household name in Canada, England, and the Eastern United States. Um, he was famed as a preacher, an author, a founder of a school and a settlement for refugees, um, and of course, uh, of the Underground Railroad hero. And then he also became the model for Uncle Tom in Harriet Beecher Stowe's Uncle Tom's Cabin. Um, in 2016, that started to change because Dr. Julie King of St. Mary's College of Maryland asked for, for permission to do an archaeological dig at LaGrange in La Plata. And she wanted to search for Henson's birthplace. Up to that point, almost nobody in Southern Maryland had heard the name Josiah Henson. Even Kevin Wilson, who owned LaGrange, had never heard of him. Um, We'd all heard of Matthew Henson, of course, the polar explorer, but not Josiah. So I became fascinated with this story. I, I was amazed that anybody could accomplish that much, be that famous, and then somehow just disappear. Um, you know how sometimes you get a song stuck in your head for days and you want it out, but you can't get it out? Well, if you're a writer, sometimes a story gets stuck in your head. And that's what happened to me. And sometimes if a story's stuck in your head, the only thing you can do is just write it out. So anyway, the clue to finding Henson's birthplace lay in the opening of all four of his autobiographies. In every edition he wrote, I was born June 15, 1789, in Charles County, Maryland, on a farm belonging to Mr. Francis Newman, about a mile from Port Tobacco. I'm trying to change the slide here and not having much luck. Let's see if it's... Nope. Okay, Neil, a little help here. I got on the arrow and then I couldn't get it to move. Okay, thank you. I hope you won't have to do that for every slide, but I make no promises. <laughs> so there's only one farm in the county that had been owned by Francis Newman, and that was LaGrange. Now, many of you are familiar with LaGrange. Probably all of you have driven by it. It's on Route 6 uh, in La Plata. It's one of the largest pre-revolutionary homes in the county. And by the uh, side of the road, there's a historical marker for James Craig. Uh, Craig built LaGrange in 1765. Less than a decade later, he became involved in pre-revolutionary war activities. And as you know, he became a personal friend and the physician of George Washington and was with him at his death. Uh, LaGrange became the property of James Craig's son, William, who then sold it to Francis Newman. Now, Craig was undoubtedly the most famous owner of LaGrange. Francis Newman was undoubtedly its most infamous. Uh, Francis Newman was born in England in 1759. He married his first cousin, Francis. Then a couple of years later, uh, he left his wife to live with his mistress, Lydia. And that created something of a scandal, so they moved to Paris, where for some unknown reason she called herself Naomi. From there, they decided to move to America. Uh, when she died, uh, Newman, who was still married to his cousin Francis, married Elizabeth Fryer. So um, he was not, as people once quaintly put it, a man of good character where women were concerned. Uh, that was not his only character weakness. He bought a small tract of land. He added to it until eventually he bought the land that LaGrange sat on. Before the War of 1812, uh, he was offered a military honor, the position of Colonel of, of uh, Cavalry in the Maryland Militia, and he accepted, but he had one caveat. If the war actually broke out, his resignation was immediate <laughs> because he didn't want to be involved in a war, and he had property in England, and they might confiscate that. 
So he, he wanted the honor, but at a risk-free level. So after that, uh, 1814, he was appointed county tax collector. Now, after the Revolutionary War, there was a deep economic depression in Charles County. So it's lots of planters amassed debts. Newman may have been able to uh, collect some of the money, but whatever he collected, he didn't turn into the government. So he was also a tax fraud. So given his character, uh, you will not be surprised to learn that he was also a terrible, cruel uh, slave uh, worker. So Josiah Henson was very young. He was born there. He has one vivid memory of his life at LaGrange. And that's when the, the overseer <coughs> raped his mother. His father heard her scream and he ran to rescue his wife and he beat the overseer. A black man hitting a white person, no matter what the circumstances, was to say the least, not acceptable. His punishment was horrible. They nailed his right ear to the whipping post. He got 100 lashes, and then the ear was severed as a way of releasing him from the whipping post. After that, he was sold to the Deep South, and uh, the Henson family never heard from him again. So like many other Charles County planters, Newman had massive debts. In his will, he stipulated that LaGrange be sold to Wilfred Manning. Everything else had to be sold to pay his debts. Even though the Henson family worked at LaGrange, Newman was not their slaveholder. That was Josiah McPherson, a physician, uh, who had actually named the young boy after himself, Josiah. Uh, McPherson really didn't need their labor, which is why they'd been sent to LaGrange to work. Um, but when he learned how, what had happened to Henson's father, he brought the Henson family back to live with him. And Henson described that as a bright spot in his childhood. That didn't last long because McPher McPherson, coming home from a party, was dead drunk. He fell off his horse and he landed in a very shallow stream and drowned because he was too drunk to save himself. He was also in debt. And so all his property, which would include, of course, his, these, his enslaved workers, had to be sold to clear his debts. Now, as a side note, uh, this theme of being sold to clear debts is, recurs not only in Henson's life, it's very, very common in the life of many enslaved persons. We think of the enslaved as unpaid, involuntary labor force, but they actually serve very much like liquid assets. Um, being taken from their families and sold for something as small as paying for a woman's ball gown. Oh no, sorry. <laughs> uh, there, you go. there we go. Okay. Uh, in 1805, Josiah, who would have been maybe seven years old, uh, and his family were auctioned off. His brothers and sisters were bid off first, one by one. Then his mother was bought by Isaac Riley of Montgomery County. And when Josiah was put on the auction block, his mother pushed forward uh, to where Riley was standing, fell at his feet, and begged him to buy her baby as well as herself but Riley kicked her and beat her until she crawled away. Now after this, this is no longer a Charles County story, so I'm gonna to switch to kind of a highlights reel. Uh, young Josiah was bought by Adam Robb, a prominent Montgomery County businessman for about $30. Uh, Robb purchased children cheaply and warehoused them until he could turn a decent profit from them. But uh, young Josiah was housed in a room with 40 people. He was neglected, he did not get enough to eat, and he became so ill that it looked like he would probably die. At that point, Adam Robb really didn't want him anymore, and he encountered uh, Isaac Riley, who'd bought his mother, and they made a deal. Isaac Riley would take Josiah, if he died, pay nothing for him, and if he survived, he would do a little horseshoeing for Adam Robb. So the good part was that 
Henson was reunited with his mother, uh, and he was overjoyed. Life on the Riley farm was daunting, and Henson later described Riley as coarse and vulgar in his habits, profligate, unprincipled, and cruel. Yay. Uh, Henson's description of life on the plantation is very, very close to that of Stephen Douglas. The enslaved uh, endured grueling labor, unrelenting hunger, inadequate clothing, and miserable living conditions. Henson describes the dirt-floored log huts like this. In a single room were huddled, like cattle, 10 or a dozen persons, men, women, and children, our beds were collections of straws and old rags thrown down in the corner and boxed in with boards. The wind whistled and the rain and snow blew in through the cracks and the damp earth soaked in the moisture till the floor was miry as a pig's sty. In these wretched hovels were we penned at night and fed by day. Here were the children born and the sick neglected. So these are, are horrible conditions, but despite that, Henson began to thrive, and he began to show the characteristics that really would define the man. He was extremely strong physically, he was very hard working, very, very smart, and very competitive. He was also ambitious, he said he was probably more ambitious than Caesar, and he thrived on praise. And that ambition and that love of praise would soon cause him to make the worst decision of his life. Uh, still in his teens, he became the overseer of the Riley Plantation. Now, most overseers were white, but there were exceptions. Having an enslaved overseer spared the slaveholder of the cost of a salary, and it also maintained complete control over the person. So Henson started out at first being in charge of the farm, and then he added to this selling all the farm produce in the markets in uh, Montgomery County, Georgetown, and DC. At this point, now he's still a teenager when he's the overseer of this farm, uh, he has two life-altering experiences, one spiritual and one physical. When he was about 18, his mother, who was a devout Christian, urged him to go hear a sermon from a local preacher. And as a black man, he couldn't go in the meeting house, but he was able to stand near the door. And he heard the preacher say that Christ had died for every man, the high and the low. And realizing then that the enslaved were equal to slaveholders in the eyes of God, he was instantly converted. The experience was pivotal because he used his Christian faith to shape decisions he made throughout his life. Um, at this juncture, of course, he never would have imagined that he would become the famous Father Henson, who was known for his preaching uh, throughout the eastern United States, Canada, and England. Now, remember that his first slave uh, holder, McPherson, died when he fell from a horse because he was drunk. Well, in Montgomery County, on the weekend, the planters would get together, and they would drink, and they would gamble, and they would talk about local events and politics. But each planter had to bring with them a man who could get him on his horse and hold him on his horse while he drove and lead the horse home uh, so that he wouldn't be too drunk and, and fall off his horse. It's not surprising that fights broke out. And the other duty of this man that was brought along was to get the planter out of the fight. So one night when a fight broke out, Henson tried to get Isaac Riley out of the, the fight. And in doing so, the man he was fighting with, his overseer, fell down, was knocked down. It's not sure what happened, but he blamed Henson. So about a week later, Henson was out running uh, errands when he was trapped. And uh, this other overseer and his henchman beat Henson so brutally that they broke both his shoulders and his arms. Uh, it was five months before he could return to work, and as a result, he could never lift his arms above his head again. Um, the, the damage was so apparent that one of his biographers referred to him as the, the maimed fugitive. Uh, during these years, he married Charlotte, who was enslaved on a nearby plantation. Now, marriages among the enslaved were not legal 
arrangements. If a minister d conducted the ceremony, he might end the marriage by saying, or he might end the ceremony by saying the marriage would land last until circumstances, distance, or death separated them. So if the couple were separated by a transfer or a sale, and the woman were of childbearing age, she would usually be forced to remarry. Isaac Riley, like Newman and like Fearson, accumulated so many debts that the Montgomery County Sheriff was going to seize his assets. And his assets in this case were primarily his enslaved uh, workers. So Riley decided to outwit the sheriff by sending all his enslaved workers to his brother's plantation in Kentucky. Um, his brother Amos had a much larger plantation and could use the extra workers. And that way, when the sheriff came, there'd be nobody to seize. Now, Henson had never gone farther than D.C. or Georgetown, uh, the edges of Montgomery County. He'd never traveled far in his life. And now he was told by Isaac Riley that he had to lead his family and all the enslaved workers to Kentucky on foot over the mountains in February. But the choice was either to do that or to stay and be seized by the sheriff, in which case they would certainly be sold almost certainly separately and probably to the Deep South. So um, he undertook the journey. Uh, Isaac Riley knew that once he got Henson to promise to do this, he would do it. He would carry through because he would never break his word. Uh, so all along the way, Henson was praised by the people he encountered because he was able to lead these people unshackled, which was unheard of, because they were devoted to him and wouldn't run away. Uh, when he got to the Ohio River, he sold the horse and the wagon and bought a boat, and they headed along the river toward Kentucky. But when they reached Cincinnati, um, people on the shore were shouting at them, telling, come ashore and you can be free. And Henson was tempted, um, a temptation he should have given into, obviously. He was tempted, but he'd given his word. And he thought that, as a Christian, it was crucial that he do what he said he would do. Um, he also admitted that his pride um, and his love of praise influenced his decision. And he also admitted it was the worst decision he made in his entire life. Once in Kentucky, Henson became the overseer of Amos Riley's much, much larger plantation. Um, because there was so much room there, he wasn't under the same kind of surveillance and he had a lot more freedom. Um, so, uh, so he started taking advantage of that relative freedom and going to meetings and listening to preachers. And in 1828, he uh, became um, a preacher in the Methodist uh, Episcopal Church. Now, Riley had initially thought that he would leave Montgomery County and go to uh, Kentucky and reclaim his workers, but that, that didn't ever happen. So at some point, he contacted his brother Amos and said, go ahead and, sl and sell all the people that I sent to Kentucky and just sent Henson and his family home. Um, Henson had never thought about running away. Again, he thought as a Christian that running away was a kind of theft. But he did hope to buy his freedom. So on the way back to Maryland, he preached along the way, and he lectured, and he got saved up money. And when he got to Maryland, he did a negotiation with Isaac to buy his freedom. Um, Henson was illiterate, as were almost all enslaved persons. Um, so they negotiated a deal where Henson would give Isaac Riley all the money that he had earned by preaching on the way to Maryland. And then later he'd send him $100, and in return he got his manumission papers. What Henson had no way of knowing was that Isaac Riley changed the numbers on the manumission paper to a number that Henson would never be able to repay. So Henson didn't get his freedom, and he lost all the money he had.
uh, one year later, suddenly, uh, Amos told Henson that he and his son, Amos Jr., uh, because we don't have enough Rileys in this story, would leave the very next day for New Orleans. And they'd go on a flatboat. It would be loaded with livestock and produce and things that they could sell on the way down the river. Now, New Orleans was the largest slave market in the country. Eli Whitney's invention of the cotton gin had increased production of cotton, and therefore they needed more labor in the fields. Uh, after that, short a few years after that, the Louisiana Purchase opened up this enormous tract of land, and that needed labor too. So as the demand for labor increased, the prices for laborers skyrocketed. So many enslaved persons in the north were sold down the river um, where they would fetch higher prices. So Henson pretty much knew that if he was being sent on a boat to New Orleans to sell livestock and produce, he was one of the items that they were going to sell. Uh, he had some very good fortune there because Amos Jr. became very ill and he couldn't get home without Henson's help. So Henson found his way back to Kentucky, but he knew it was just a matter of time before he'd be sold again. Although the term Underground Railroad wasn't in use in 1830, which was the year Henson escaped, the system had been in place almost since the beginning of our country. George Washington complained because two of his slaves ran away, and his complaint was it was so hard to get them back because of those Quakers. So the Underground Railroad, even though it wasn't called that, was in function from the very beginning. Um, the National Park Service defines the Underground Railroad like this. The Underground Railroad story is like nothing else in American history, a secret enterprise that today is famous, an association that many claim but few can document, an illegal activity now regarded as noble, a network that was neither underground nor a railroad, yet a system that operated not with force or high finance, but through the committed and often spontaneous acts of courage and kindness of individuals unknown to each other. Now, most escapees were young men who traveled alone because it was so dangerous and running away through, you know, through unmarked forests, evading slave catchers, evading dogs, it was so arduous that it wasn't exactly a family-friendly activity. Um, Henson, however, said that uh, he wouldn't leave Kentucky without his wife and his four children. So he had his wife sew two large, heavy cloth bags, and he actually carried his two younger children, aged two and four, to Canada. His two older children, 10 and 12 at the time, walked with his wife. Uh, their journey began on a Saturday night. A friend risked his life to row them across the Ohio River to the Indiana shore. But once they got on shore, they had to walk as fast and as far as possible to get to some forest where they could hide because even though Indiana was Technically a free state, there were slave, slave catchers who prowled the shore all the time. Um, for two weeks, they hid in the forest during the day. They walked on a road in the night, ducking back into the woods if they heard anything um, approaching. Now, many of you have had children. All of you have been children. That is quite a feat. <laughs> Um, they suffered hunger and, fur and thirst. They were terrified of being caught by dogs or slave catchers. It was only when they reached Cincinnati, finally, after two weeks, that they were able to get to a Quaker safe house where they could rest and get some food. Then after that, they again walked by night, but they ran out of food and they suffered from exhaustion. Fortunately, they came across a Native American encampment and they were taken in and they were fed and they were allowed to spend the night. They traveled on again in foot and once they reached Sandusky, Ohio, Henson found a Scottish captain who would take him and his family to Buffalo, after which they would only have to cross the river to be in Canada. 
They'd left Kentucky in mid-September. They arrived in Canada in late October, a six-week ordeal. Um, they had eluded slave catchers, they'd stayed free of debilitating diseases, they'd avoid wild animals, they'd face starvation, exhaustion, and exposure to the weather. They'd been fed, sheltered, and shown the route to freedom by Quakers in Cincinnati, Native Americans in the Ohio wilderness, and a Scottish captain in Sandusky. The Underground Railroad, that unofficial network of highly organized anti-slavery groups and chance encounters with people of courage and integrity, had delivered another family to freedom. So for the first few years in Canada, Henson worked as a tenant farmer, and he began to preach again. But he knew there was a better life than tenant farming. So he gathered a group of about a dozen people, and they agreed to pool their earnings and buy land on which, as he said, every tree which we felled, every bushel of corn which we raised would be for ourselves. In other words, we would secure all the profits of our own labor. Now, when Henson became free, he vowed to save as many other people as he could. So during this period, while he's working and saving money to buy land, he starts coming back into the United States to lead other people to freedom in Canada. Over the years, he said he saved 118 people. Uh, the African American Registry says he saved 200. Um, but however many people he saved, clearly, that number, any of those numbers, marks him as one of the greatest heroes of the Underground Railroad. Because every time he went back into the United States, he risked being caught, uh, in which case he would certainly be re-enslaved. Uh, he would undoubtedly be tortured. Um, and if he were caught helping others escape, he almost certainly would have been killed. So it's an incredible act of feat, uh, a, a feat of courage for the, the people who had the courage once free to go back and help others. The Dawn Settlement. This is the next thing that happened in, Hen in Henson's life, and it's one of the things he's most noted for. He met Hiram Wilson, who was a recent graduate from Oberlin Theological Seminary, and he was a member of the Anti-Slavery Society. So Wilson got money from British philanthropists, and they purchased land at Dawn. Um, which is about 50 miles north of Detroit. And Henson and Wilson established the British American Institute, which was a school designed for refugees. It would teach them the basic skills people learned in elementary school. It would teach manual labor skills to the boys and domestic skills to the girls. Um, in other words, it would give them what they needed to function as free people in their new land. The school opened in uh, 1841, and students attended classes for part of the day, and then they worked part of the day so they could create goods to sell to help support their school. At this, uh, the common practice in Canada as new settlements developed was to clear the land by burning the trees, cutting and burning. But Henson realized that at dawn, there were lots of hardwood trees, including black walnut, and that that had a, a monetary value. So he uh, built a sawmill on the land, uh, it's actually on the school's land, in order to generate money for the school. And at this point, he started making lots of trips back into the United States to sell lumber. Uh, some of you have probably heard of Jonas Chickering pianos. The black keys on those, on many of those, were made from the black walnut trees at dawn in Canada. So within a few years, the settlement dawn had a grist mill, brickyard, forge, and shops. It was a real functional community. It was comprised not strictly of uh, freemen from the United States, but primarily so. So to provide more funds for the British American Institute, uh, Henson traveled through the Northeast United States, lecturing and preaching. Then in 1851, he decided to take some of those black walnut boards to the London uh, World's Fair, because he thought he could open up a new market for lumber um, in England. 
Across the top of the boards, it was written, this is the product of the industry of a fugitive slave from the United States whose residence is in Dawn, Canada. About six million people viewed the exhibits, including Queen Victoria, who stopped to ask if Henson really was a fugitive slave. There were hundreds of exhibits at this fair. His was the only one by a black man. The, the horrifying reality is there were other black people at the fair, but they were exhibits brought for people to see. So by this time, Henson was already pretty well known in Canada, and in England he became a celebrity. He met the Archbishop of Canterbury, he met the former and the current prime ministers, he spent time preaching and lecturing about the evils of slavery and the necessity to educate fugitives and the impoverished uh, of every country. And then he was suddenly called home to Canada because his wife Charlotte was dying. Uh, a few weeks after, Charlotte, after uh, Henson returned home, Charlotte did die. And Henson was grief stricken for years. But finally, he realized that he'd become a very lonely man, and he decided to remarry. Uh, he married Nancy Gamble, a free woman from the United States. Now, at the British American Institute, there was a serious problem with finances. There was disarray. There was mismanagement. And so the British and Foreign Anti-Slavery Society had taken over the school to try to fix things and, and make things more stable. They appointed John Scoble to manage the school. Scoble was a charter member of the society. He had spoken at world conferences. He was an ardent abolitionist. Uh, and he had even done much to eliminate slavery in the French uh, West Indies. So he seemed like he would be perfect. Hiram Wilson had also left the school already. And Scoble said he would make the school a glorious moral lighthouse a beacon whose illumination should be perpetual. Well, he didn't. The school became dilapidated. Scoble could not manage to rebuild it. Like Henson and Wilson, he was a visionary, but he was not a practical manager. Uh, so Henson ended up suing Scoble, and that suit dragged on for years. The sawmill had been very productive and had done very well for them, but the new manager of the sawmill loaded three boats of lumber and sailed away. And when the workers finally realized they were not going to be paid and he was not coming back, in their anger they ripped the entire sawmill apart, including destroying the foundation. So with that, that was the end of any hope of raising revenue to keep the British American Institute alive. And in 1872, the land and the school were sold. Now, 30 years seems like a really short time for a community to be built, flourish, and die. But there were other such communities in Canada. One of them was even uh, founded by the Canadian government um, because there were so many refugees from the United States fleeing into Canada. None of these communities lasted more than a couple decades. They all met the crucial needs of fugitives of the fugitives had. They had freedom, they gave them education, they gave them land, they gave them employment. But it wasn't Eden. They still faced the exact same kinds of prejudice that they'd faced in the United States. So when the Civil War broke out, a lot of refugees left Canada to fight on the uh, side of the Union. When emancipation came, a lot of them left Canada to, to be reunited, reunited with their families. And those who'd been farming in Canada went home to farm in a much more hospitable climate. Um, in 1853, Harriet Beecher Stowe's famous novel, Uncle Tom's Cabin, was published. Millions of copies were sold. It was the best-selling novel of the 19th century. Uh, in fact, in the entire 19th century, the only book that outsold it was the Bible. Now, the hero of that no novel, Uncle Tom, was a devout Christian. He sacrificed himself to save others. He was tortured, and as he was dying, he forgave his tormentors. 
Students of literature, you recognize this. This is called a Christ figure. It pops up in literature. Um, now, Stowe obviously had to flesh out the Christ figure to make him a believable character. And some elements of Uncle Tom's life uh, she took from Josiah Henson because she'd read his autobiography and she'd spoken with him. So in his third and fourth autobiographies, Henson referred to himself as an inspiration for the Uncle Tom character. He was clever enough to say an inspiration, not the inspiration, because Stowe had interviewed lots and lots of people and read lots of material and included many people as, uh, as part of the Uncle Tom character. But what happened was that he became inflated with the most popular and famous literary character of the time, and his fame skyrocketed. He'd always been a popular speaker, but now he was in demand everywhere. Um, he always introduced himself this way. It has been spread abroad that Uncle Tom is coming, and that is what has brought you here. Now allow me to say that my name is not Tom, and never was Tom, and that I do not want to have any other name inserted in the newspapers for me than my own. My name is Josiah Henson, always was, and always will be. Despite his denial, he was so closely associated with the fictional Uncle Tom that his disclaimers didn't alter the belief at all that he was Uncle Tom. And of course, as the definition of what Uncle Tom was changed, his reputation was also affected negatively by that. As soon as Stowe's novel appeared, pop-up stage versions came immediately. And the first two were pretty close to the novel, but there was a problem. It was such a strong anti-slavery novel that slaveholders did not like it. So one year later, the P.T. Barnum Theater put out a new version of Uncle Tom's Cabin. They toned down the abolitionist stuff because that was offending some people, and they added a lot more elements of the minstrel show. Um, and so that was a very popular play. Then one year later, T.D. Rice, who was a white actor who played in blackface, he's the one who created the Jim Crow character, he did a minstrel show mocking Uncle Tom. So what happened was what we call flipping the script. Uh, instead of being a strong man like Henson and the fictional Uncle Tom was, the new character was weak. Instead of being smart, he was stupid. Instead of being middle-aged, he was old and shuffling. Everything that Josiah Henson and the literary Uncle Tom were was changed to be the opposite. But that was the most popular form of entertainment, minstrel shows. And so these shows popped up. They were so popular, they were called Tom shows. And groups of actors called Tomers would hop on a train, go to the station, hop off, do their little minstrel show, get back on board, go to the next stop, and so forth. That happened even in Canada, in Dresden, a few miles where Josiah Hansen was actually living. Um, and that, that pretty much changed the, the notion of what an Uncle Tom was. The literary Uncle Tom sacrificed himself to save other enslaved people. Josiah Henson, from his work on the Underground Railroad, clearly sacrificed himself to help, uh, help others. But the minstrel show made Uncle Tom into a traitor of his race. Um, OK, so Henson uh, had sued Scoble. He finally won the lawsuit after years but he'd incurred a lot of debts. Um, so in 1877, to recoup his losses, he was now 78 years old. He went back to England to do another lecture tour. While he was there, Queen Victoria invited him to Windsor Castle to meet the royal family. And then as a special gift to the staff there, they were all told they would be allowed to meet Henson. But when they were introduced to him, they were introduced to Uncle Tom, not Josiah Henson. Um, so, um, there, I'm sorry, got behind myself. There's Jim Crow, um, and that's T.D. That's Rice, the actor, who did so much to destroy Henson's reputation. 
and that's Queen Victoria and Henson there. Um, so um, after Henson, oh, after he met the Queen, they came back to the United States and he was invited to the White House to meet Rutherford B. Hayes. After that, he wanted to go back to the old Riley Plantation where he'd spent so many years. Um, he thought of it nostalgically. He thought it would be the way it had been when he left it. But when he got there, the house was dilapidated, the fields were overgrown, the orchards were dead. Uh, so he asked Riley's, Riley had died long ago, he asked Riley's wife Matilda what had happened to the workers. And she said, some died, some were sold, and Lincoln freed the rest. So he said, well, why didn't you pay some to keep them? And she was shocked. She said, they weren't worth paying. Um, so after that, Henson returned to Canada. He continued to preach and to lecture. In 1883, he died at his home in Dresden. Despite the failure of the British American Institute and despite his association with Uncle Tom, he was the undisputed patriarch of the community. The head of the British American Episcopal Church in Canada conducted the ceremony. Nine preachers preached. Mourners filled the church and the churchyard. A brass band preceded the hearse, and 50 wagons followed to the burial ground uh, on what was once the British American uh, Institute and is now Uncle Tom's Cabin Historical Site. So that is where Henson rests now in Canada. He was stuck with another choice between two bad things, escape or wait till they sold him. And if they'd sold him to the South, which was, since they took him to New Orleans once, was almost certain to happen, they wouldn't have kept his wife and four kids. They would have sold them separately too. That's where the biggest profit lied. Oh, he didn't. I mean, he did a little. His son, uh, when his oldest son was 12, uh, he discovered that his father was illiterate. Like many illiterate people, he faked it beautifully. So people didn't know. And, and I think part of, I mean, he was never actually the head of the school, but part of the problem with the management of the school was his inability to read any documents. Um, no, he would, before he preached, he would have someone read him a passage <coughs> or a chapter from the Bible, and he had the kind of memory that could memorize it and just make a sermon out of it. <coughs> Excuse me. Uh, I'm going to answer the question you didn't ask, but some people have asked me. How do we know Henson was really born at LaGrange? Okay, we will never find a letter from Newman referring to that little scamp Josiah. Uh, we're not going to dig up a section of a log from a log cabin that has his name scrawled in it. There will never be that kind of concrete proof. But there is lots of evidence. First of all, he says he was born on a farm owned by Francis Newman, and there's only one of those in Charles County. That's part of it. But then when he was taken back to McPherson, Josiah McPherson actually named Josiah after himself and he gave him the last name Henson after, I think, his uncle. So there was obviously a connection there. And because, um, because McPherson, like it seems everyone uh, who owned land was in debt, his, uh, all his uh, effects had to be sold at auction. So there's an inventory. And there's an inventory of his medical equipment, his books, showing that he was a doctor and an inventory, <coughs> excuse me, of his enslaved workers. And one of the people on the inventory is named Sai. Sai was his nickname, short for Josiah. It was Sai being sold by McPherson at age, they had nine, but it was probably wrong, it was probably seven. Um, that's as much evidence as you're going to get. Um, and so that's one of those situations where archaeologists and people in intelligence say a very high level of, of confidence that he was born at LaGrange. Yes, uh, what they were looking for, I mean, they found thousands of artifacts, of course, 
But what they were looking for was evidence that there were slave cabins dating from that time when he would have been there. If there hadn't been any slave cabins, which actually was unlikely, I mean, but still, when they found evidence of a group of cabins, they could say with some certainty that that must be where he was born. It's in Davies County. It's near Owensboro. It's, on the, it's right on the river, just south of Indiana. And by the way, if you ever go there, Davies County is now the barbecue capital of the world. <laughs> <laughs> Although, so they say. <laughs> You know, Harriet Beecher Stowe, all that Stowe family, um, were really, really smart people. They were wonderful progressives at the time, but they were also very practical. And I have a feeling that she felt as long as her name was out there and Uncle Tom's cabin was out there, it's like they say, bad publicity is still publicity.